So welcome everyone and thank you so much for being with us for this online 5x15 with an incredible lineup here this evening. It's our last 5x15 of the season before the summer break and we're thrilled to have so many people joining us as we journey into the future and into the past meeting trailblazers and groundbreaking icons with our incredible speakers and storytellers here with us this evening. Each has got 12 minutes to tell their story and, and tweet us, let us know what you think um, as ever, the podcasts are coming soon and, um, and Stephanie's going to be putting the book details in the chat. New and Books will be very, very happy to help you with all of those. So first up and returning to 5 by 15, we have the wonderful and legendary magazine editor, Dylan Jones. Um, we're delighted to have him back with us again to talk about his new book, which looks at the 80s, a decade of big ideas writ large, and it's called Shiny and New, 10 Moments of Pop Genius that defined the 1980s. So Dylan in the 1980s was one of the first editors of ID magazine. Um, he became a contributing editor of The Face and then editor of Arena. He worked on all of our major newspapers before embarking on his um, major um, multi-award winning career at GQ, which is where he's been for the last 22 years, an absolute tour de force. So Dylan, it's an honor to have you back with us and thank you for joining us all the way from Wales and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Daisy. And uh, I hope my, uh, I, I am up in the, the wilds of the Brecon Beacons at the moment, and I hope my internet lasts. It's been uh, kind of in intermittent all day. Um, firstly, I'd like to, to thank you, uh, thank 515 for inviting me back to speak. I think this is at least the third time I've appeared. Um, so I can only assume that this is some sort of weird twisted experiment, but anyway, thank you. Um, I've got a huge library here and um, a lot of the books are about the 1960s. There seems to have been more books written about the 1960s than almost other, any other decade uh, since the war. And it's the sort of lodestar, the springboard uh, for all the extraordinary events that happened after that decade, a uh, uh, decade that seems to uh, shatter uh, all the um, assumptions that we had made um, about life and pop culture before it. Um, but they also say that if you can remember the 1960s, then you probably weren't there. Well, I was only a boy in the 60s, and I can't really remember very much of it at all. Well, I can remember the 1960 World Cup final, um, but I can remember pretty much everything about the 80s, um, every nightclub, every dodgy haircut and every pair of pixie boots. And um, uh, I really love the 80s, um, so much so that um, I've now written three books um, about them. So I'm beginning to think that I'm, it's, uh, it's, I'm, I'm legally obliged to only write books about the 80s. Um, I think I'd actually write, like to write a book about the 70s and the 90s, but I'm not sure my publishers would let me get away with it. I'm even starting to film uh, a BBC Two series about um, the 80s come September. A few years ago, I wrote a book about um, Live Aid, um, uh, looking at the decade through the prism of all the artists that appeared at Live Aid. And last year, I wrote a book uh, called Sweet Dreams, uh, which was about the new romantics, um, which um, is a period that I think had been uh, unfairly sort of maligned previously. And it showed how punk and disco and club culture helped create new romantics, new pop, um, electropop and the MTV culture of the early part of the decade. Shiny and New, as Daisy said, is, uh, is my new book. And it's, it's an actual sequel to Sweet Dreams. 
which is a book that attempts to show the kaleidoscopic nature of pop in that decade uh, and the way in which it splintered. Um, I've taken each year and wrote and written a book, uh, written a, um, a chapter about a particular record, uh, which not only shows the way that uh, the genres exploded in that decade, but also trying to write about um, culture um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger way, in a kind of um, macro way. Um, the 80s, I think, is an extraordinarily important decade. And I suppose I've taken it as some kind of mission to try and redeem the decade. Uh, it's a decade that's much maligned. Um, uh, it's a decade uh, that people think is somehow brash, trivial, uh, where music became uh, driven by technology. And in, in certain respects, it was driven by technology, but I think technology acted in a, in a, uh, uh, as a sort of, um, as, a, as a catalyst, it was emancipation actually. And I think that the aces in terms of pop music is, the, is, is where pop music stopped being linear uh, from the late forties, right up until the late seventies and the early eighties, one thing sort of begat another or, or um, rubbed up against something else. Everything followed something before it. But in, in the eighties, things kind of exploded. Uh, and that was driven by technology. Um, and technology also afforded uh, media um, in, a, in a very different way. It delivered media in a very different way and also allowed for some of those characters that I've written about in the book um, to dominate in a way that um, pop figures hadn't really been able to dominate before. So I write a lot about uh, people like Bruce Springsteen and Madonna. Um, Madonna, uh, a new kind of invention. Bruce Spring Springsteen, someone who had survived the 70s, but through MTV, through pop video uh, and through technology, managed to um, conquer the world uh, in some respects. Um, I also write about Prince, um, someone who uh, was probably one of the most enigmatic um, stars of the decade and someone whose influence at the time was um, incredibly powerful. Um, his, his influence was sort of compounded by the fact that he was a recluse um, and, and rarely, rarely spoke to the press. Um, so I've, I've written about these big figures and the way that they, uh, the way that they have changed the decade and also help the decade um, to sort of pivot, I think, because when we think back to that time, uh, there are iconic figures uh, which jump out uh, and, and Prince is certainly one of them. Uh, and Daisy said I could read a short extract, which I will, which is about Prince. Um, and hopefully it gives you a flavor of the book. On the 15th of March, 2004, George Harrison was posthumously inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As part of the ceremony at the Wardorf Astoria in New York, an all-star band performed While My Guitar, Gentry Weeks, one of George Harrison's best-known Beatles songs. The group featured Tom Petty, Jeff Lynne from ELO, Steve Winwood, and Danny Harrison, who was George's son, as well as Prince himself. During the rehearsal, most of the guitar solos were played by a person called Mark Mann, a sort of white man's overbite guitarist in Jeff Lynne's group, including a note for note replica of Eric Clapton's remarkable solo on the White Album version of the song. Prince, meanwhile, kept himself to himself, playing along with the rest of the band as though he were a journeyman session player. So come the live show, it was all very different indeed. For the first three minutes or so, Prince seemed happy to stand in the shadows. But as the song reached its final furlongs, he moved center stage, his red borsalino catching the light as he used his guitar to burn the place to the ground. His three minute guitar solo was one of the greatest moments in all of rock and roll, a moment that's been viewed over 50 million times on YouTube. Look at that figure, 50 million times. 
and deservedly so. Prince's performance was as good as anything by Jimi Hendrix, Eddie Van Halen, The Edge, or even Eric Clapton himself, in the incendiary way in which he managed to wring so much extraordinary noise out of his machine remains completely bewildering. Almost as though he were using some kind of empowered magical wand. For anyone who hasn't seen this clip, and this isn't hyperbole, trust me, as every time I play it, it mystifies me. And as for the rest of the band, they all simply looked on, shell-shocked almost, plodding their way to the song's inevitable conclusion, acutely aware that they had been royally shown up. As Prince finished, signaling to the band that it was time to draw the proceedings to a close, he threw his guitar up in the air, up into the rafters, and proceeded to walk off stage. Steve Ferroni, who was Tom Petty's drummer, was playing that night, and he says, I didn't even see who caught it. I just saw it go up. And I was astonished that it didn't come down again. Everybody wonders where that guitar went. And I was on that stage and I wonder where it went too. Soon afterwards, someone said, it was almost as if George Harrison had grabbed the guitar himself in midair to signal, that's enough of that. Um, Thank you very much for listening, me to, uh, uh, listening to me this evening. There are some fantastic speakers um, coming your way, including Jack Guinness, who has written a brilliant book, which I think is, um, uh, is such a clever, uh, um, a clever proposition. And, and Jack and I have worked together for um, many years, and I wish him incredibly well with the book. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a fantastic night. Good night. Dylan, thank you so much for being with us and for making that work for us. You are brilliant and we love your stories and Shiny and New is out now and I hope that everybody will pick up a copy and discover more of those pop moments that defined the 80s. Thank you very, very much and we'll see you again soon. So next this evening, it is our honour to introduce the explorer, writer and geographer Nick Crane, also known to all of us as a presenter of primetime BAFTA award winning TV series such as uh, Coast and Map Man, amongst many other programs. And in his beautiful and enthralling new book, Latitude, he tells the story of the world's first ever international scientific um, expedition, which aimed to define and discover the shape and magnitude of the earth. And I'm going to be showing a few images um, as Nick speaks. So welcome and over to you, Nick. Thank you, Daisy, very much. And thank you, Dylan. I'm one of the many millions who watched that, watched that Prince video over and over again. Isn't it brilliant? And wonderfully written up. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you uh, a story of courage, collaboration, initiative, uh, ingenuity and science in adversity. So a story for our times. And I'm going to begin, if I may, by reading the very short first paragraph of my book Latitude because it sets the scene for this expedition. We're in Rochefort, a port on the west coast of France in the 1730s. The tide was turning, soon the moon would pull the sea down the Black River. From the darkness came the gargle of water on wet mud and the eerie calls of unseen birds. On the west bank, the roofs and towers of Rochefort fused with the inky sky. A muffled clunk carried through the damp air. Boatmen, were taking to their oars. The waiting was almost over. The ship's hull shivered as her three masts turned across the fading stars. Morning had broken on the 12th of May, 1735. Well, on board that French frigate that May were 10 French scientists. They were sailing to South America. En route, they were gonna pick up two Spanish scientists. Now the quest for the disparate dozen of the Enlightenment was to measure on the ground the precise length of one degree of latitude at the equator. They were then going to compare that figure with the length of one degree of latitude in France, which had already been measured. And by comparing those two figures, they're going to work out the precise shape of the Earth and figure out whether it was stretched at the poles or bulged at the equator. 
They knew Earth wasn't a perfect sphere, but did it bulge at the equator? Now, it sounds a fairly abstract kind of quest for 12 scientists to sail halfway around the world in 1735, but it really mattered because without knowing the true shape of the Earth, you couldn't construct accurate sea charts and land maps. So the story of latitude picks up where Darvis Sobel's longitude leaves off. Very different stories. Longitude, of course, was the story of the brilliant English clockmaker, John Harrison. Latitude is the story of this very disparate and actually dysfunctional group of scientists who set off several decades before Harrison completed his fifth brilliant maritime clock, seagoing clock. So who were these, these uh, international scientists? Well, the leading trio came from the Fran French Academy in Paris. Their leader was Louis Godin, totally ineffective as a leader. You wouldn't want to put him in charge of the lingerie. The, the best of the three at, at math, at mathematics, was Pierre Bouget. He was a professor of hydrography from Britain, Brittany. And then if we could have the first picture, please, Daisy. My favorite uh, of the trio was Charles-Marie de la Condamine, a war veteran, uh, a friend of Voltaire, a bit of a, <clears throat> a bit of a reckless troublemaker, an adventurer. Um, the two Spanish lieutenants were very young. Uh, they were trained killers, uh, and they were brilliant navigators. And they'd been selected for the expedition because without having two Spaniards on board, uh, the French wouldn't get permission to operate in the Spanish-controlled South America. It was a Spanish colony. So the Spanish were there actually as a diplomatic um, uh, make-happen operation. Alongside those five leading scientists were the, the uh, specialists and the assistant. So there was a surveyor, there was an artist, there was a botanist, instrument maker, two assistants, a surgeon, and a dog. It took them one year to reach the Pacific coast of South America. So this is, you know, in the age of the internet, this seems absolutely mad, doesn't it? But a year to get from the west coast of Europe to the west coast of South America, that's because they had to sail the Atlantic, they had to muck about in the Caribbean, picking up supplies. Then they had to cross the Panamanian Isthmus on mules and on, on horses to reach the Pacific, then hitch another uh, uh, ship down south to um, the coast of Quito. Uh, now they had a lot of junk with them, a lot of equipment. Uh, among their equipment were crates and crates of scientific instruments. They had 21 trunks of books. They had nine barrels of, of French spirits, 225 pounds of gunpowder. They had swords and muskets, 28 tents, blankets, surgical equipment, cooking utensils, dress clothes and wig powder and stashes of Andalusian tobacco. Could we have the next picture, please, Daisy? Now, this painting by um, Frederick Edwin Church, American landscape painter, is, uh, if you like, it's, it's, it's a romanticized imaginary image painted in Europe of what Europeans thought that equatorial South America looked like. It's amazingly accurate in terms of its components. You've got a a ravine full of a, a, a river with snow melt in the foreground. You've got the rainforest in the middle distance. And then behind, at the back there, at the left-hand side, you can see the rising pyramid of a snowy volcano, because this is the land of the volcanoes as well. Now, as soon as they got on shore, they found that all romance left them. It's very tough indeed. Not in this painting were the things that make life very difficult for an explorer. Snakes, llamas, Getting, having to travel by llama, carry, put their luggage on llamas, opossums, scorpions, they're all stung by scorpions, mosquitoes, absolute nightmare, and jaguars, which would raid their food at night. Uh, so it's quite a struggle. Remember, none of these people, you know, had ever been to equatorial South America before. It wasn't, you know, there were no planes or, 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 or cruise ships to get you over to South America to have a, do a recce. Uh, so they're all newcomers. Um, the team itself um, was too big to be controlled by one leader. And as I suggested, Louis Godin was, 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 was not um, a man who, who ought to be put in charge of, uh, of the laundry, let alone an international expedition. And he lost control very early on, not least because he spent a lot of time in the Caribbean in, in a brothel and squandered valuable expedition funds on a diamond for his favorite prostitute. Um, so that wasn't a great, uh, a great image for the expedition leader. Um, and pretty soon he became discredited by the rest of the team. And the man who really took over was Pierre Bouget, the hydrographer. La Condamine, the my great hero, was the other leading light. Um, now the problem with La Condamine was that he was very keen on his own side trips. And uh, as soon as they made landfall on South America, before he even started the main scientific work, 
Le Condamine took off on his own into the rainforest to go in search of, among other things, a gold mine, uh, while the rest of the expedition con continued down the coast to Guayaquil and inland on a convoy of mules and horses over the mountains, over the, over the high Andes to get to Quito, where they were going to be based for the entire mission. Uh, Le Condamine eventually caught them up and uh, on the way he had done some very interesting research on rubber. He produced the first European description of rubber, nothing to do with measuring one degree of latitude, but that was the, the story of his, his 10 years in South America. He kept discovering peripheral uh, uh, interests and, uh, and, uh, and, and science that collectively changed the, the whole nature of the expedition. Um, I mentioned some of the difficulties they faced. One of the, one of the great things then was, you know, um, this, this is the, the old world of the Inca Empire. There were no wheeled vehicles in the Inca Empire. And so this, this was 200 years after the Incas had been wiped out by Spanish conquistadors and disease. Um, the means of travel was pretty much the same. So you traveled on horseback or on foot or on mules over precipitous mountain trails. When you came to a river, you crossed on a swaying rope bridge or you had your horse um, uh, dragged across in a rope sling to the far side. Getting swept downstream in these ferocious ravines, uh, these, these snowmelt rivers was one of the greatest risks. Disease was also an enormous risk. Um, and you get a hint of this from the, the mission's doctor, Jusso, who uh, found that one of his most difficult um, ailments to, uh, to, to cure among the expedition members was gangrene in the rectum, as he described it. Um, a, a treatment, and here's the, here's the prescription for dealing with gangrene as a rectum. It must be attended, he says, with no small pain, as a pessary composed of gunpowder, guinea pepper, and a lemon peeled is insinuated into the anus and changed two or three times a day till the patient is judged to be out of danger. So just imagine what it's like riding a horse with an explosive pessary um, inserted. Not good. Um, now, a, a, apart from gangrene the rectum, the other kinds of ailments they, they faced included malaria. And within a month of arriving in Quito, um, the youngest member of the mission completely tragically was dead. He died of malaria, he's a very short, ferocious fever and he'd gone. So already before they'd started work, they'd lost one of the 12. Now the main part of the mission consisted of laying out a virtual chain of triangles over 200 miles of the Andes. These are this is a, a chain of, of, of volcanic mountains. Some of them lie volcanoes separated by a deep valley. And they'd chosen this place because they intended, to, they intended to use the high points on the volcanoes for the corners of the triangles. They had to measure the angles within the triangles uh, to compute the length of the sides of the triangles. And by doing that over and over and over again, laying out 30 or 40 triangles over 200 miles, they'd be able to measure on the ground the precise length of one degree of latitude. Actually, the, the triangles was going to cover three degrees of latitude. And then to make it more accurate, they'd extend it from one to three. Then they were going to mathematically reduce it to one. So it's a very, very accurate operation. So 200 miles of triangulation lay ahead of them. Um, if we go to the next picture, please, Daisy. Um, now, I wrote this book. Um, uh, in the depths of the lockdown um, and uh, uh, last year, starting in about um, January. So I didn't have access to my usual sources of research, the London Library and the British Library. I, I'm in central London now and it's just a, a, a 10 minute bicycle ride to both of them. And, and so this is, a, I, I write non-fiction books, so not being able to get at those two libraries was a real challenge. And so I, I, I was entirely dependent on the internet and on what I could find in my own loft above my head here. And I was very lucky because back in 1989, um, I'd made a journey to um, uh, uh, um, uh, Ecuador um, with um, the young lady who I hoped would be my wife. I, I, I was expecting pro to propose to her there, but um, it turned out to be a much more difficult land than I'd expected to travel in. So this is a picture Annabelle took of me high in the mountains, very close to one of these volcanoes that are being used to measure the triangles. Um, now, I'm, I'm flaked out in the grass here, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, there's an enormous shortage of fresh water in the high Andes. It's incredibly exposed. You can see there's no tree cover. So this is exactly the kind of terrain these 12 scientists were operating in in the 1730s. Just imagine, they haven't got Gore-Tex, they haven't got lovely warm fleece jackets and so on. They're, they're dressed in local wools, wools and cottons. Um, uh, next picture, please, Daisy. Um, so here is um, uh, a picture in La Condamine's book um, showing one of their high altitude camps. Um, it's, uh, you can see in the picture you've got the tent. Uh, this is a, a much more 
um, if you like, it's, it's, it's a, a prettified version of what was actually happening. So the tent would have looked a bit like that, but they were not dressed in frock coats. They were ragged, they were bearded, they were unkempt. They sometimes had to spend three or four weeks camping on volcanoes in a tent before being able to take the quadrant sightings they needed to measure the angles between the, the triangles. So you can see here the, the man in front of the tent, the, uh, the scientist in front of the tent has got a quadrant. He's measuring the angle between two volcanoes, one erupting on the right, one erupting on the left. And then you can see two men climbing the slopes of the volcano with staffs. They're going up there to set up the next station that's going to be measured with the quadrant. So a very laborious task. Um, and it took them four years, nearly four years to conclude the triangulation. Um, having measured the, on the ground their, 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 um, their three degrees of latitude in terms of distance, they then, then had the difficult bit to do. They had to lock the two ends of the chains of triangles to the stars using astronomy. If we could have the next pick, please, Daisy, the final one. Um, uh, and to do that, they had to use an instrument that gave them four years of strife. This is a zenith sector. You can see it ab above it, there's a telescope. It's up to 18 foot long. They had to build several of them. There's a hole in the roof because to make this instrument work, you had to build, an, uh, build, a, build an observatory for it. So you needed two devices. You needed a pendulum clock on the wall. You needed a telescope uh, uh, pointing up at the stars and you measured the height of uh, above the horizon of, of the star they were using to fix latitude. I mean, in this case is Epsilon Orion. So it took them another four years to get the measurements that would lock the two ends of their chain of triangles to the cosmos. Um, and when they finally managed to uh, get the measurements, did all the mathematics, they found that the length on the ground of one degree of latitude at the equator was 56,753 toys. The toys was a French unit of measurement at the time, about six foot long. And uh, by comparing that, that figure to the length of one degree of latitude in France, they proved beyond any doubt that one degree of latitude was shorter at the equator than at the poles. And the world did indeed bulge at the equator. It was pumpkin shape, shape. So that was their very successful exhibition and, and you know, 10 years to come up with a number. It, was, it, was a, it seems like a very straightforward quest, but it led to all sorts of difficulties. As I mentioned, the youngest assistant uh, died of malaria. Uh, the surgeon was murdered uh, during a, a fiesta in a, in a bull ring. Um, and of the, of the 12, um, uh, only eight of them came home. Um, apart from the one who died of disease and the one who was murdered, the artist, um, fell to his death from scaffolding on a church. He, had, he was doing work on the side to try and make money to save up enough to come home. The instrument maker, the man who'd built the Zen sectors for them never did come home. Uh, he was stranded in France, unable to, to uh, raise enough funds to get a ship back home. And La Condamine, my hero, he, uh, he should have come straight back. Um, but uh, having survived 10 years on the equator in storms and all sorts of trials and tribulations, he. Uh, decided to come back the difficult way and uh, built a balsawood raft and came down the Amazon to the Atlantic and then took a ship back from there. I'm just going to close with a, with a, a, a reading I, I absolutely love. It's a picture of one of the two Spanish naval lieutenants, the, uh, the guy who was 19 when he got, went out to uh, the equator. And here he is in his 70s back in Spain, described by an English clergyman who went to visit him. Uh, Ulloa was seven, in his 70s at the time. This great man, diminutive in stature, remarkably thin and bowed down with age, clad like a peasant, occupied a room that measured 20 feet by 14 feet, in which were dispersed confusedly chairs, tables, trunks, boxes, books and papers, a bed, a press, umbrellas, clothes, carpenter's tools, mathematical instruments, a barometer, a clock, guns, pictures, looking glasses, fossils, minerals and shells, his kettle, basins, jugs, American antiquities and money. I love that image of the explorer at home in his retirement. I'd like to end up like that one day. Um, as for Le Condamine, the maverick who enjoyed experiments, he died of blood poisoning after inviting a friend to conduct an experimental hernia, hernia surgery on him. And what a guy. Um, the true legacy of this extraordinary band of explorer scientists was their Pioneering, pioneering role as the world's first international scientific expedition. And today it's this international scientific collaboration that will once again decide the shape of our future world. Thanks a lot.
Nick, thank you so much for being with us. What an extraordinary epic um, tale with such an incredible cast of characters and amazing list of equipment. It would be a fantastic movie and I hope that someone will make it. Um, Latitude is out now uh, by Nicholas Crane and it was just lovely to see you again, uh, even online this time, but thank you very, very much. Um, so um, next we have uh, joining us from America, Lionel Shriver. Um, it is a great honor to have her here with us. Um, she has been christened the Cassandra of American Letters for her unerring prescience. Um, and her novel, uh, first novel was called The Female of the Species, which was published in 1987. And with um, her novel, which won the Orange Prize, we need to talk about Kevin. She took up her position as one of our leading novelists and social commentators. Um, her acclaimed funny and thought provoking new book, um, which has garnered incredible reviews across the board is called Should We Stay? Uh, or Should We Go? And it talks about what it is to lead a good life and indeed a good death. So welcome, Lionel. Thank you very much for being here and over to you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, greetings from Brooklyn. And I am indeed going to talk about uh, my novel, Should We Stay or Should We Go? Um, people who know me will tell you that having a glass of red wine on the cover is in my case all too appropriate. I first got the idea for this book just because of a casual statement from a friend of mine who announced that she had absolutely no, I, no intention of living beyond the age of 80. And that got me thinking because, you know, she was already 60 at the time. It wasn't that far away. So what was she going to do when she actually turned 80? Was she going to be proactive? Was she going to do something about it? Or would she just laugh at her younger self and carry on? So I conceived of these uh, two characters who at the beginning of the book are in their early 50s, so the age of 80 still seems a little abstract. Uh, they both work for the NHS. And when the book starts, the wife, Kay's father, has just died after a protracted period of dementia and he has become unrecognizable and obviously very trying and by the time he finally died, she was unable to cry, which is no way to lose her father. Uh, and of course, in the NHS, they've seen lots of patients who have decayed grievously. Um, so the husband, Cyril, makes a modest proposal that they be proactive about it and that once they both crossed the, the age of 80 on Kay's 80th birthday, they should take matters into their own hands um, after having led a full and wonderful life and leave the building together. Um, now, I, I'm with you. I, you know, you're immediately thinking, why would I want to read a book about that? <laughs> in fact, I made a big mistake uh, in doing hard talk last week. And I allowed the presenter to summarize the book in just that way, that it's about, about a couple of geezers who want to kill themselves together. Oh, great. That, that interview probably sold about zero copies. Um, what makes the book, I hope, worth reading uh, and, and actually fun is the structure, which is a, a parallel universe. So that I have 12 chapters, each of which has a different ending for how, the, how this pact might work out. Um, so there's, there's one in which the wife goes through with it and the husband doesn't uh, or, or vice versa. Uh, and there are even uh, in, in the latter parts of the book, uh, speculative fiction chapters where there's a cure for aging and everyone lives forever or um, Cryogenics actually works, and the couple wake up many hundreds of years hence to a to a universe that they don't recognize anymore. Um, so it was it was really fun to, to write, and I'm hoping it's fun to read. It's I'm, I I think it's actually funny, which is improbable given the premise. I was interested in this material, not only on my own account, but also on my parents, who are very elderly now. My father's 93. My mother turns uh, 90 next week. And uh, 
they're not in the best of shape, especially my mother had a terrible stroke in 2015 and is now wheelchair bound and incontinent. She's actually blind um, and not very communicative. Uh, my father is in better cognitive shape, but he's very weak. And it's not the way I think of him. He's always been a real powerhouse. Um, and so, you know, ultimately what makes watching your parents get so old uh, painful is not just seeing how you've always thought of them uh, confront physical reality, but also looking into your own future. I had to uh, face the fact that I'm actually more afraid of getting old than I am of dying, which may seem a little weird, but I just don't think dying for the most part takes very long and being old can take a long time. I'm obviously afraid of disease, uh, but not just that, but the kind of medicalization of life. When you get older, you know, you have to take 50 pills a day, all of which have side effects. And you're always having to take all these in intrusive medical tests. And I hate doctors. And I'll be honest with you, I'm uh, anxious about a future in which I completely lose my looks. And the truth is when you have uh, any kind of a public persona, your aging is a spectacle for other people. You, you age on stage. And while there is a minority of your fans may age with you and with sympathy and, and feel a little mournful about the fact that you're not quite the looker you used to be, I'm afraid it is a little more commonplace for your audience to view your decay with malicious glee. I'm also afraid of disability. Uh, I look at my mother and, you know, she was always a very active person. I've always been pretty athletic and uh, certainly self-sufficient. I'm somebody who prefers to, to open her own pickle jars. And I would dread that kind of dependency and incapacity. And almost as much, I would uh, dread irrelevance. You know, I look at my father and he doesn't have very much to do with himself. And that's so contrary to my experience of him during the prime of his life. I mean, when we were growing up, he was constantly telling us to leave him alone. You know, he's got to finish this speech. He was always busy. It's really disconcerting um, to see him so uh, unoccupied. And, uh, you know, there are things like uh, this very appearance that I sometimes get a little irritated with. It's like, oh God, another thing I have to do. But I think that I would probably end up presenting not being asked on five by 15 than I would be having, uh, having this request. Um, I dread having nothing to look forward to. Uh, and I think that's very commonplace when you get older, there's just not much great that's likely to happen. And I'm also worried about the future, not just my private future, you know, whatever personally happens to befall me, but I worry about his, the historical future. I mean, those of you who have read The Mandibles, um, one of my recent novels, uh, which is all about the collapse of the economy in the United States in 2029, not very far from now. Uh, you'll know that uh, I have all kinds of fears about what's gonna happen, not just about the monetary system, but uh, uh, you know, bacteria that's resistant to antibiotics or uh, uh, water supply problems. I mean the number of things that could uh, go wrong, especially by the middle of this century when I'm gonna be in my 90s, should I be so lucky, is fantastic. So I actually put together a chapter in Should We Stay? Uh, it's called Of Ignorance and Bliss, which is about when my characters don't go through with their vow and live to beyond 100. But that means that they live to see the end of Western civilization. London is overrun with migrants and anarchists. Uh, Parliament is burnt down. Uh, the National Gallery is ransacked and all the paintings are 
ripped to pieces. And it's trying to ask the question, you know, if that's really what's going to happen, do you want to live to see it uh, out of sheer curiosity? Or would you rather bow out a little early and, and live in ignorance and bliss? And that's not a question that I find easy to answer. Now, I freely admit I'm a baby boomer. We get, we have a bad reputation on a range of levels, but I would say one of the, one of the problems with my generation is that we're the first one to, to deny physical reality. That is, we, we think we never have to get old and we never have to die. All we have to do is get plenty of exercise and eat our vegetables. In fact, that's one reason that there's a penultimate chapter in Should We Stay, in which my couple uh, not only lives into their, you know, 110 and 111, but they have thriving second careers and they become only more beautiful as they age and people stop them on the street and say, you know, can I take your picture? Would you please let me um, paint your portrait? Uh, they're never in pain, they never get sick. And even when they do die, it's, it's just this sort of wonderful revelatory moment of uh, resolution and uh, a sense of, you know, job well done. The, the thing about this chapter is that it's a satire. Um, of the 12 uh, in the book, uh, there's no question that we would all pick that one. Oh yeah, I want to age that way. But the joke is on you because that's the one chapter that is definitely not going to happen. That is not on the table. Um, so the truth is, I mean, I give my generation a hard time for having ridiculous expectations. But on the other hand, the human race has never had to deal with a large cohort of people who are so-called old, old. Uh, it's worth remembering that uh, just as far back as the middle of the 19th century, life expectancy was 40. And that meant that we didn't get old, we just died, right? Um, and so this whole experience of having to navigate this kind of gradual decay is very new for our species and we don't quite know how to handle it. In fact, we haven't even figured it out economically um, because we're still retiring uh, in our 60s. Why in France, you can still retire in some occupations in your early 50s, it's economically absurd. You know, you can't work for 35 years and then retire for 35 years, if not 50. I mean, that, that, that just doesn't work. Um, but the truth is that my book, and if you're looking for answers to these questions, my book doesn't have it. Uh, like most novels, uh, Should We Stay is full of lots of questions and it just throws how to answer them back on the reader. I think that's what a good novel is always meant to do. Um, I guess the one, um, the one sort of lesson that I would hope you might take away from it is that we tend to approach our every stage of our life, bar the last one, with a sense of intention. That is, you know, when we're kids, we decide what to, what, what to be when we grow up. Or, you know, when we're young adults, we find mates, we settle down in a particular part of the country, we accept one job and not another. You know, uh, maybe we plan to have a family. But the one part of our lives that we apply very little agency to is the last bit. So I'm asking you just to think about it. None of us want to think about it, right? It's, it's not the happiest time of life, though I think it may have some satisfactions that may surprise us. Um, so I'm just suggesting that maybe give a little thought to how long you wanna stick around and what kind of vicissitudes are you willing to put up? Lionel, thank you so much for doing that. That was such a brilliantly um, 
put together talk and what a genius idea for a novel. And um, I'm very frank and very funny at the same time. And thank you for, for being so honest and for sharing that with us. Um, we, um, we just loved having you as part of this. Should We Stay um, is out now. And I think um, everyone will want to read that and discover more after hearing you. So thank you very, very much for being with us and for finding the time to join us today. Um, so next um, I'm introducing Jack Guinness, who is one of the funniest people that I know. Um, he is a commentator, he is a model, he's a, a contributing editor at GQ, as I think Dylan might have mentioned. Um, and he's written for many, many publications, but this evening he's here to talk about his new book, The Queer Bible, which was launched um, in Pride Month last month. And he's brought to together a stellar and incredible um, list of contributors, queer icons, to talk about their heroes, their trailblazers who have inspired them. And contributors include Elton John, Graham Norton, Paris Lees, Russell Tovey, many, many more, and it's beautifully illustrated as well. So welcome, Jack. Thank you so much for being here, and what a delight to see you, and over to you. Thank you, Daisy. Um, it was the pop star Sam Smith who ruined my life. It was a few years ago at the Oscars and Sam then identified as a gay man and now identifies as non-binary. And Sam had just won the Oscar for best song. Sam made a really moving, very heartfelt speech about how proud he was to be an out gay person uh, receiving this award. And during their speech, Sam said that they were probably the first out gay person to win an Oscar. Sam then went backstage to that uh, huge press junket of uh, you know, flashing bulbs and shouting journalists. And Sam was promptly informed that not only was Sam not the first out gay person to win an Oscar, Sam wasn't even the first out gay person to win that category of Oscar. Now, the world being the wonderful place that it is, instantly, there was a huge Twitter storm. People were attacking Sam, saying how disgusting it was that young LGBTQ plus people don't know their history. And I myself was about to pile on. And then I realized I don't know my own queer history. I'm a relatively, a relatively well-educated person. I'm a very privileged white gay cis man with access to all sorts of information. And I hadn't done the work. I didn't know my own queer history. So I did what any relatively well-educated person would do. And I went online and I searched on Google and there were a lot of resources online. Um, but a lot of them were very academic. They were quite ugly websites. They looked like they'd been made by, you know, remember the little paper clip on Microsoft Word, the little clip that would tell you when your uh, grammar and punctuation were wrong. And they were all done in kind of comic sans with purple font. And I thought, wait a minute, LGBTQ plus people are supposed to be the most fabulous, creative, amazing human beings on the planet, if I do say so myself. So we need a website that reflects that. We need a space where we can share our stories that is beautiful in form and function. So I didn't want to, um, but I set about founding the Queer Bible, which is that it's a space for us to celebrate our shared history. So because of Sam Smith, I had to leave behind my very shallow, fun life of being a male model, guzzling champagne and talking rubbish to celebrities where my only skill was standing still long enough to have a photograph taken of me, which isn't really a skill at all. And I set about founding the Queer Bible. So what is the Queer Bible? Very simply, I ask my heroes to write an essay about one of their queer heroes. And as Daisy said, each essay is illustrated by uh, a young LGBTQ plus artist. Um, the word hero always kind of sticks in my throat. It's kind of a saccharine, very limiting, concept. I like my icons or the people I look up to to be messy like me. I like them to be flawed human beings. An example of one of the early essays was I tracked down one of Robert Maplethorpe's boyfriends. He had quite a few of them. But one of the most important people in his life was a man called David Crowland. David Crowland wrote an essay for the Queer Bible about in my mind, I assume he was on acid or something, but I don't think he was. I'm just kind of trying to make it a bit more sexy and more can roll. But he went to the Chelsea Hotel and he met a young woman called Patty Smith, 
and her then boyfriend, Robert Maplethorpe, and he promptly steals Robert Maplethorpe off Patti Smith. The rest is just kids. The rest is history. If you don't know who Robert Maplethorpe is, you've got this incredibly sexy, brilliant, glamorous rock and roll tale that's going to inspire you to go off and do your own research. And if you do know who Robert Maplethorpe is, you're given this secret untold story. I think the main issue with LGBTQ plus history is that there isn't enough of it. I grew up uh, under the Conservatives under Section 28, which, which made it illegal to promote whatever that means, homosexuality in schools, have the idea of the image of, uh, kind of gays, like, I don't know, promoting homosexuality. I have no idea what that means. But what it did mean for teachers was it meant that they were terrified to talk about homosexuality, about any LGBTQ plus issues. So that's an example in my life of LGBTQ plus histories being erased. For other reasons, uh, throughout history, people have hidden who they are. They've hidden the the fullness of who they are, of their gender identity or their sexuality for their own protection. I've done that in my own life. I've hidden that I'm gay for my own mental and physical safety. Or we've had times where the fullness of people's identities has been straight washed from the history books. It hasn't been included in the official histories. So going back to my life, I grew up in Brixton in the 1980s i was the son i am still the son <laughs> of a vicar so i grew up in a small flat attached to a vicarage and everything in my life was beige we had beige wallpaper we had beige carpet um, we had whole wheat pasta we had a beige volvo we had bran flakes for breakfast every day i remember the first time i saw corn flakes i thought there was something wrong with my bran flakes so i was quite a dramatic excitable child and I dreamed of glamour. I dreamed of something more to take me out of my depressing beige life. And one day on the television up popped this Amazonian creature. It was RuPaul performing a song with Elton John. And it was a re-release of the track he did with Kiki D, Don't Go Breaking My Heart. And in the video they played different, it's ridiculous the video, you must YouTube it. They played different uh, kind of lovers from history. And as a child, I didn't realize that Elton John was gay. I thought he was a confirmed bachelor, a ladies man. I assumed that RuPaul was probably one of a long line, a long stream of women that were coming in and out of his life. And I, I didn't even know that RuPaul was a drag queen. I didn't know that it was a man in a dress playing with and challenging gender um, identities. But there was something in them. James Baldwin writes about how LGBTQ plus people know each other before we know. There's something about them. I sense something in them that was different and magical. And it called me out of my depressing, very Christian, beige childhood. And weirdly, RuPaul kind of sent me, set me on the course to pursue a fashion, uh, a career in fashion. I, like many queer people, are attracted to the shimmery things, to the glamour. I think growing up and being told that you're disgusting, that you're not worth anything leads us to seek out status giving armor. I personally was drawn to the world of fashion, of celebrity, of designer clothes, of status giving jobs. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So I decided um, to write my essay in the book on RuPaul. Graham Norton, I know we're not supposed to read extracts, but my book is not my words, it's other people's words. Graham Norton writes beautifully and hilariously um, and very movingly about the isolation that one feels as a young LGBTQ plus person. I never came out. It didn't seem practical. Living in a small town in rural Ireland in the early 80s, there was no context for me to be gay in. So why tell anyone? I would just have been gay watching afternoon TV or riding my bike into town with no prospect of being gay in the very important boy meets boy scenario. I felt it would have just upset everyone without any real benefit. Instead, I resolved, resolved to go where the boys were. And I did the same thing. A lot of LGBTQ plus people set out into the night to find their tribe. It's a universal experience. We're all looking for our tribe, whether you find it in a drag troupe or you find it in a football team. 
The Queer Bible Project is uh, about speeding up that process. It's about connecting young and old LGBTQ plus people up to their proud history. I want young people to know that not only are they not alone, but they are descended from some of the most fabulous, incredible human beings on the face of the planet. So once we found our new chosen family, it's an incredibly empowering thing. We see ourselves finally reflected back in others. The incredible activist Monroe Bergdorf writes about the joy of watching the documentary Paris is Burning. It's about the New York drag ball scene. And Monroe writes about how seeing trans people uh, in film leading their own lives, telling their own stories, empowered her to connect to the fullness of her identity. She writes, I saw queer history through a white lens because that's what I had been immediately exposed to. To be able to identify the root and to figure out that I had a direct link to the provenance of so much queer history was extremely empowering for me. It involved me and it allowed me to access a power that took my difference and made it positive turning it into something that I could always get power from. That's what happens when you realize you connect to those who went before you. They become an immense source of ancestral power that you can draw from whenever you need to. You are not the first to walk this path. Our stories echo each other. Black and brown trans women have trod this ground, clearing a path for you. They are there when you need to call them, stretching back thousands of years. This is the power of connecting to your true family. Stand in that power. So you've found your chosen family. You're on the journey to self-acceptance and self-love. But what then? Uh, the comedian Mae Martin, annoyingly and brilliantly, then in their essay, kind of destroys the whole premise of the queer Bible, which is the power of naming yourself and the power of identity. May um, writes this brilliant essay about Tim Curry, who was in uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Tim's the exact queer icon that I love because he is a bit messy. He's a bit problematic. He never openly talked about his sexuality and, and neither did he need to. Um, but May writes about watching the Rocky Horror Picture Show when they were really little, um, really young, when they were about five and it blew their mind. It's probably a bit too young to watch the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And May looks forward to a future beyond the binary, beyond labels, beyond identity politics, where maybe we can be freed from some of the trappings of narrow identity. May writes, the phrase, don't be it, don't, don't dream it, be it when Tim Curry's floating in the pool at the end of the Rocky Horror Picture Show and they're all having a massive orgy. That is what I want for my life. My sexual orientation is being in that pool, getting off with tons of fit people of all genders. That's my sexual orientation. I remember watching Rock Rocky Horror and asking my parents, is he a man or a woman? They said, he's kind of both. I was like, cool. I asked, is he gay or straight? They replied, he's both. It just seemed like, oh great, the world is my oyster. That song at the end of Rocky Horror, where he's got blue eyeshadow streaming down his face, singing, I'm going home. And he's channeling this Judy Garland performance like later Judy Garland, just iconic. Who needs labels? That tells you everything you need to know. So I would leave you with the question, are there parts of your identity that you're keeping hidden? And alternatively, are there parts of your identity that are limiting you? Are, are there potentially bits of your armor that you can remove? The tagline for the Queer Bible is, we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's time to learn their names. So I'd invite you to connect up to those people who inspire you, who went before you, so you can locate truly who you are now and look forward to the future. Thank you very much. Jack, thank you so much for being with us. And it's such an incredible book. It's so rich and full of such wonderful contributors and stories, um, a, a really monumental achievement. I was reading um, Graham Norton's essay yesterday and it was so moving and entertaining. I was really, really um, inspired by it. And thank you very, very much for your talk.
The Queer Bible is out now and everyone uh, should get a copy straight away. Thank you, Jack, and we'll see you again very, very soon. Um, so our final speaker this evening, who I'm delighted to introduce, is Holly McNish. She is one of Britain's best loved poets, and we were so pleased to have her back at 5 by 15 after her absolutely incredible performance um, in Bristol a few years back. Um, she's winner of the Ted Hughes Award for Nobody Told Me, her verse memoir of parenthood. Um, she um, co-wrote a play called Offside, which is about British women in football. Um, she's the first poet to ever record at Abbey Road Studios, releasing an album of poetry and music entitled Verses. And she's a patron of Breast Milk Action, which is a very important organization. So she has a new book, which is out now. It mixes prose and poetry, and it's called Slug and other things I've been told to hate. And she's here to tell us a little bit about it. Welcome, Holly, and over to you. Oh, thanks so much. And thanks for asking me on this. I've really loved it. Um, yeah, so it's called Slug and Other Things I've Been Told to Hate, and it's all about the things that I just have wasted time. I feel like I've wasted a lot of time in my life uh, feeling ashamed of things that I definitely should not feel ashamed of or being embarrassed to speak about certain things. And it has really, I'm just bored of it. I'm bored of different taboos and I'm bored that we're still in a culture that is teaching our children a lot of a lot of these still it's changing but but slowly so it's a book of poetry and prose and I'm going to read you a few poems to finish off so a little whistle stop tour of the book I guess but it covers a lot of different topics from grief to masturbation to blood to just chatting to strangers on trains so lots of things that I've yeah just wasted time being ashamed of and I'm going to start with this poem it's called chasing ceremony or convincing myself and I wrote it about a minute after watching my grandma's funeral live streamed into my living room and um she died during the first lockdown and I obviously wasn't allowed couldn't go to her funeral and in my head I, I sort of thought being so embarrassed to cry in public as I am and have been taught to be that I I might actually prefer it I find funerals quite awkward um, I'm not sure anybody really loves a funeral I find them important but I don't really like showing my emotions in that way in front of people so I thought it might be okay and afterwards after watching the the live stream I just felt so crap and I remember seeing my mum in the live stream sort of leaving the crematorium just wishing I could have a hug and realizing that all the embarrassment of crying in front of in front of people was nothing compared to having nobody to cry with at this funeral so uh this poem's about that and then I'll swiftly move on to blood and, <laughs> and masturbation so chasing ceremony I'll not get to your funeral that's fine I know you'll not make mine you hate the fussing anyway your favorite color is yellow not black on your street, when next door died, too soon before you did. Neighbours clapped the passing hearse as if the corpse were on a royal tour. You turned towards your daughters. Here, don't you dare do that for me. Hair cradled into rollers each night until the night you left, still begging life for curls. The laws do not allow me to stand and watch a lifetime exit puppet show size curtains as tears try to console each other two metres apart. The only good things are the sandwich platters afterwards anyway, and we can't even have those. So I'll celebrate you here, 300 miles from home, wear that butter-coloured jumper you once said made me pretty. Wallow in self-pity, as if your loss is all my loss. Let lips tremble all they want. Eyes swell, too embarrassed, red, too obvious a grief to meet with any friends, even with the recommended coffin space between us. No need for all that, huh? Who cares about it, right? I already said I love you so many times in life. Each time I said I love you, each postcard that I sent, each nighty that you lent me, each evening that we wasted watching pre-records of Countdown at a volume that I'm almost sure has pierced some of my eardrum. In refining, just that splash of milk to slightly hint your tea with, until you looked inside the cup again and smiled and said, that's perfect. 
Right, I'm going to move on to my granddad. So this poem is called Blood Granddad, and it is one of my strongest memories of my absolutely brilliant granddad. And um, he always, always, whenever a advert for sanitary products, menstruation products came onto the telly, he, he would always get up. I didn't really understand why when I was younger, but he always used to get up and leave the living room and stand behind the door in a sort of silent protest because as much as he was a lovely, lovely man, he thought it was absolutely disgusting that anything about menstruation should ever be shown on, on TV, including products to um, help us deal with it. So this, this is a poem, a loving poem from a granddad called Blood Granddad. Don't worry, granddad, it's not that blood. It's just scuffed knees blood, weak nose from a cold blood, finger cut on paper blood, tiny line of red blood, and you sort of wish blood that there was more blood because paper cuts never look quite as painful as they are blood. So don't worry, granddad, don't get up. It's not that blood. It's just kids' blood, just Tom and Jerry blood, cartoons before school blood, cat's brains bashed with saucepan blood, just fairy blood, just story blood, Snow White's lips as red as blood, Aurora pricked her finger blood, Rapunzel's lover fallen blood, thorns blinding both his eyeballs blood. So don't worry, Grandad, don't get up. It's just PG blood, just Fortnite blood, just Harry Potter's Horcrux blood, just fake crime blood, just true crime blood, just crime book blood, just Rocky's blood, just Rambo blood, just Arnie blood, just Bruce Lee blood, just war films blood, more war films blood, just young boys, barbed wire close up blood, a pan of all the bodies blood, corpses piled on poppies blood, just saviors nailed to crosses blood, just thorn of crowns, just Game of Thrones, just House of Cards, just House of Lords, just fighting blood, just violent blood, just dying blood just dead blood so don't worry granddad don't get up it's not that blood it's not birth blood it's not ugh, blood right i'm gonna move on to masturbation and then do uh do one more i think so this poem i i wrote because i think shame is a real well it, literally a killer I don't think um we blame the right thing I think shame is to blame for so 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 much awful awful stuff so much depression so much pain and um I'm, I'm just so sick of it and this is a poem that I wrote and I wrote it after for about a, a week for some reason I, do, I don't I don't watch a lot of a lot of porn at all but for some reason I was getting those spam emails loads one week um saying that they'd hacked into my computer and they'd caught footage of me masturbating to porn and they'd share this with the world unless I sent a lot of money to them and I know a lot of these emails are spam emails but some of them aren't and I had a friend that had this sent to him and the, the video of him was sent so they had hacked into his computer and um and he just sent an email around to all of us saying Oof, um I've been caught wanking <laughs> someone's hacked into my computer uh please don't open it if unless you want to see me wanking and I'm not paying these people money and I just thought that was amazing and if we weren't so ashamed of things then we couldn't be um used and abused because of that shame so this poem is a personal reply to those spam emails and it's it's got quite a long title it's called if I could reply to the spam emails telling me that they've hacked into my laptop camera and have footage of me masturbating to porn and will share this shameful footage of me masturbating to porn with the world unless I transfer loads of money into their bank account right now. Warning. Your device was recently infected with the software I developed. Warning. The software has recorded you masturbating wildly. Warning. We have all of your contacts. We'll send it to your mother. We'll send it to your family. We'll send it to your friends unless you send us all your money. Warning. There is nothing wild about me wanking. When I masturbate, I hardly even move. My face looks like a statue of a concentrating fish. It would possibly be the most tedious film to watch. My friends don't give a fuck. And my mother is much more interested in bird watching and nature documentaries than her daughter jacking off okay I think I have got time for one more so thanks very much for having me and thanks for listening so this is a uh, a final it's a, a short version and a long version of the same thing and um it's about the sort of 
argument you still have, I think, in a lot of schools about uniform policy. And I was I was very well behaved at school. And the only thing I was really told off for was having a skirt that was too short. And nobody explained to me why this was a problem. They just said um, it was distracting the boys. So I tried to kind of argue my case one day when I was sent into the headmaster's office again. So there's a sort of long version of that argument and a short version. I'll read the short version first. Arguing in the headmaster's office. He said, my skirt was distracting the lads. Roll it down, legal length below knees like a nun. I said, some of the boys have their trousers so tight I can see the outline of their dick, sir. I still managed to get on with my work. And then this is the long and final poem. And it's called, When I am dead, will you finally shut the fuck up? And um, I guess it's just about being a teenager, teenage girl in particular, um, which I think is a very hard time, teenage, teenager dom. When I was a teenage girl, the newspapers printed stories about monsters they called paedophiles. When I was a teenage girl, a special assembly was called, which told us all to watch out for a man flashing his penis in the park near the school. We all thought it was funny, walked there especially, looked out for the long coat, giggled with our friends. When I was a teenage girl, one newspaper printed a list of home addresses of people they called paedophiles, vigilante justice and one count of linguistic ignorance graffitiing the walls of a paediatrician's home. When I was a teenage girl, I bought a top 10 record by another teenage girl dancing in school uniform like mine. She sang Hit Me Baby one more time. I sang Hit Me Baby one more time, not wondering whether the clever chorus line referred to punching or being fucked hard or replaying a record. When I was a teenage girl, my friend was called a slag for owning a vibrator. When I was a teenage girl, my friend was called a prude for not getting fingered. When I was a teenage girl, the front cover of this album had Britney Spears in pigtails looking up at a camera as virgin as could be. I did not wonder who directed it. When I was a teenage girl, my friend told everyone he had fingered me in the garden at a house party that weekend, when really he was crying about a problem in his family. He apologised at school. I agreed not to tell the truth. We stayed close friends. When I was a teenage girl, I opened the CD in my bedroom, a poster folded up inside to put up on my wall. It had Britney dressed in a virgin white vest top with virgin white teeth, sat astride a chair, legs parted for the camera, camera zoomed onto her schoolgirl crotch. When I was a teenage girl, I was told not to use a tampon when I was bleeding playing sport because that would be like losing my virginity to a tampon before I'd had a dick in me. I was told not to put a dick in me. I was told old told the only sex that counted was sex with a dick in me. When I was a teenage girl, two teenage girls in a Russian pop video were directed to snog each other in school uniform like mine, looking sexy at the camera, singing all the things she said, all the things she said, running through my head, running through my head. When I was a teenage girl, I was told off for wearing a skirt too short for school. I rolled it down each lesson, rolled it up each break. When I was a teenage girl, I was told I could not play in a tennis team unless I wore the match kit. Match kit was a short white skirt. I was on my period. I did not use a tampon yet because that would be like ruining my pussy before I'd had a dick in me. Sanitary towels leaked a lot. I learned how to check for blood stains between backhand lobs. When I was a teenage girl, I was told not to risk the shortcut. I was told not to walk alone. I was told not to stay out late. I was told not to masturbate. I was told not to get pregnant. I was told not to get fingered. I was told not to be too sexy. I was told not to not be sexy. I was told to sing, hit me, baby. Hit me, baby. Hit me, baby. One more time in school uniform like hers. I was told all the things she said, all the things she said, running through my head, running through my head. When I was in my twenties, I fed my baby in the toilet for fear of looking like I was sort of trying to look sexy. I'm still not sure exactly why I was embarrassed to feed a baby with my body, but I was. When I was 30, my friend organized a Botox party before we went on holiday, because apparently when you're 30, laughter is less attractive. When I was 35, I was told not to wear a vest top because women my age do not show our arms now for fear of bats apparently landing on the skin below. When I was 40, I was told my sex drive would dry up with my bleeding, but no one talks about the menopause. When I was 50, I was told, when I was 60, when I was 70, when I was 80, I was told, I'm hoping this will stop. But my grandma is 92 and she is on a diet because in our family, as I've been told my entire life long, the women in our family have bad stomachs. Hold it in, Holly, hold it in, Holly, hold it in, Holly. When I'm dead, I'm hoping I can stretch out in my coffin, 
silence in my bones. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Holly. That was electrifying from start to finish. And we are so pleased to have you back with us at 5 by 15 and to celebrate your new book, Slug, which is out now. Thank you very, very much for being with us. We are your greatest fans. Um, and thank you to all of our incredible speakers um, this evening. Please um, pick up the books. We have our friends at New and Books who will be more than happy to help you um, and join us for a forthcoming session. We have lots uh, still coming up and we'll be back in September with more 5 by 15s. But what a lineup from uh, this evening. It was so thought provoking and frank and honest. And we're really, really grateful to all of our speakers, Dylan Jones, Nick Crane, Lionel Shriver, Jack Guinness and Holly McNish. Podcasts coming soon, um, a link to catch up and watch the session again. And for now, uh, good night to all of you and we will see you again very, very soon.